We are in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 13. In the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians, you remember that the Apostle Paul basically comments to the Christians in Thessalonica that they have been going through persecution, they've gone, been going through afflictions. That's the word the New American Standard uses. But, Paul says, remember that Jesus is coming again in flaming fire, taking vengeance or afflicting those who afflict you. Taking vengeance on those who don't know God and do not obey the gospel of Christ. So Jesus is coming again. If Jesus isn't coming again, there's no point in worshiping. There's no point in living a good life. There's no point in any of that kind of stuff. Eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die if Jesus isn't coming back again. But He is coming again. If the Bible is to be believed at all, Jesus is coming back again. And that has been one of the important uh, points of First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, and that's what we studied last week, Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses one through twelve, where Paul points out that there were some people, even during his lifetime, who were teaching an, a false doctrine that Jesus has already come, and they were doing so apparently through letters written in the name of Paul maybe in the name of other apostles. So there were false letters being circulated very early in Christianity. It doesn't take long for somebody to decide they don't like what the truth sounds like. And so they're just going to start teaching something else. But so Paul says, well, there's going to be a mass exodus from the church, an apostasy. Uh, we talked last week. We don't know much of those details as much as we would like. I assume the Christians in Thessalonica who received the letter understood pretty much everything Paul was saying. We're just separated from them, and Paul doesn't give all the details we'd like to have, but Christ hasn't come back again. And so we know that the man of lawlessness or the spirit of lawlessness is still at work since Christ hasn't come back again. So that brings us to verse 13 of chapter 2, and we'll go down through verse 5, and then next week we'll finish up with uh, the letter, verses 6 through 18. And then the following Wednesday night, two weeks from the night, we're going to jump to the Old Testament and we're going to study the book of Numbers. Now, I don't want you to start yawning when I say we're going to study Numbers because we've got to show Cody that there really is something to learn from the book of Numbers. Okay, so this class is going to be for Cody's benefit. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 13, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. So we go back and we reflect on that verse, and here's the questions that I gave you last week. Why does Paul say the missionary should pray for the Thessalonians? Notice his words. We should or we ought always to give thanks. Why? Because they're loved by the Lord. There's another reason in the verse. What's that? They were because God has chosen them. How come they were chosen? How Why were they chosen? Somebody answer us this question. How, how do we know they were chosen? How do you become chosen? In verse 14, Paul goes on to say, It was for this He called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm, I'm fast-forwarding a little bit to answer Russ's question. Verse 14, now how does God call us? through the gospel. So, when we respond to the gospel, then we become members of God's chosen people. Is that right? That's what Paul teaches in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. We are not chosen as individuals. 
were chosen in Christ. Christ is the chosen one. That's explicitly said by Jehovah God in Luke chapter 9 and verse 35. At the, uh, Luke's account of the transfiguration of Christ, God says, this is my son, my chosen one. So Christ is the elect one. We are elect or chosen only if we are in Christ Jesus. Now that's the biblical doctrine of election. Okay, anybody have any questions on that? So the missionaries, Paul says, and I say missionaries plural, remember, because Paul, Silas, and Timothy all co-wrote this letter. There are 50 verbs in First and Second Thessalonians that are plural verbs. We encourage you. We see this. We do that. First and Second Thessalonians has the highest concentration of first-person plural verbs in the New Testament, which shows that Silas and Timothy were as much involved in the writing as Paul was, even though we preachers and teachers always talk about Paul writing First and Second Thessalonians. So, what does the Spirit do in our salvation? We're back to verse 13 now. What does the Spirit do in our salvation? He sanctifies us. What's the word sanctify mean? Set apart. It's related to the noun holy or the adjective holy and it's related to the noun saint. We are saints because we are sanctified and made holy. All three of those words are the same root word in the original language, both in Greek and in Hebrew. Now, we're set apart. So we were in sin when we were Christians. God calls us through His gospel message. And who gives us the gospel message? Who is the person behind the giving of the gospel message? The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit presents to us through His Word the nature of Jesus Christ, the character of Jesus Christ, the plan of God that is consummated in Jesus Christ. When we obey the words of the Spirit, then He pulls us out of that world of sin and He sets us aside in service to Christ. There's a whole lot more that could be said about that. Back under the law of Moses... How were, how were objects sanctified and put into service to God in the temple or in the tabernacle? There's one thing specifically I'm thinking of that God required the Jews to do to sanctify objects to put them into service in the tabernacle. They had to be sprinkled with blood. That's what I was looking for. We have our hearts sprinkled with blood, the blood of Christ, metaphorically speaking, when our bodies are washed with pure water, obviously a reference to baptism. That's Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. So the Holy Spirit is involved in all of that. And that's why I emphasize over and over again that you can't be saved by obeying what man teaches. If, if somebody is obeying what a man teaches, then the Holy Spirit is not operating on their hearts. It's man that's operating on their hearts. We have to open the Bible and let the Holy Spirit speak to people's spirits through His Word. That's how, that's how we can know that somebody obeys the gospel of Christ, to go back to Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. And we know that the Holy Spirit sanctifies us through His truth because Jesus says that in John 17 and verse 17. In His prayer to the Father, He says, Sanctify them through uh, your truth. Your word is truth. All right, back to verse 13. In what should we have faith? In the truth. Do you trust the truth? Do you trust the truth? Notice what Paul has said about the truth in this context. Going back up to verse 10, we need to love the truth. In verse, e, verse 12, we need to believe the truth. And in verse 13, we need to have faith in the truth. To go back to Jesus' famous statement in John 8 and verse 32, the truth will make you free. 
It's the truth about Jesus Christ. So we always need to be concerned about what is truth. Yes. That was Pontius Pilate to Jesus when he was being on trial in John chapter 18. I believe it's verse 36. You can check me on that. But Jesus says that he was born to be a king. He was born to testify to the truth. And that's when Pilate threw out that question, well, what is truth? But he didn't hang around to listen to Jesus give the answer. Dell, have you ever been in a conversation with somebody like that? They throw a question at you, but then they don't hang around and wait for the answer? Is that the right verse? Verse 38, John 18, verse 38. What is truth? We should always be concerned about what God's truth is. And when we find it, we need to plant our flag on it. We need to plant our feet in it. We need to bury our hearts in it. We need to latch on to it with our teeth like a bulldog to a stake. Verse 14, we've already read, it was for this he called you throughout. Notice, it was for this. To go back to Russ's question, how are we chosen? It is for this that He calls you through the gospel. It is for this. What is this? So that God can choose you through sanctification of the Spirit and faith in the truth. That's the, why God called. That's the reason why God called us by His gospel, so we could be sanctified and trust His truth. The gospel is for all, and everybody needs to have a copy of it in their language. Okay, any thoughts or comments on those couple of verses? Verse 15. Paul goes on to say, So then, which is drawing a conclusion, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. The very last lesson I gave on 1 Thessalonians, I pointed out that there were 20 commands in 1 Thessalonians and there are 7 commands in 2 Thessalonians. And here's the first one. Stand firm. Paul is saying the same thing as I just got finished saying. Plant your feet on the truth. Now he says stand firm and hold and the connotation of that verb is to hold tightly. Gail, does the old King James Version say hold fast? Or does it just say hold? It just says hold? Okay. Stand fast and hold. All right, so the connotation of the verb is to hold tightly. Stand fast and hold tightly to the traditions. I thought traditions were wrong. If it's the traditions of men, paradosis is the, the Greek word for traditions, and it literally means something that is handed down or something that is passed along. The word is found just in those verses that I have on the screen. Matthew chapter 15 and Mark chapter 7 is the parallel context where Jesus criticizes the Pharisees, you remember, because they were elevating the traditions of men to the same level as the commandments of God. you remember that? And what does Jesus say in that context that you do to the commandments of God when you hold fast to the traditions of men? You make the commandments of God of no effect. You can't be saved by the traditions of men and the Word of God. Yes, in fact, right, now the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church has the position basically that the Pharisees had in the day of Jesus. The Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church there were seven worldwide church councils in the first 700 years of church history. They were called ecumenical councils. Ecumenical means worldwide. 
They had discussions, for example, about the nature of the Holy Spirit, the nature of Jesus Christ, the nature of icons, and things like that. So the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church accepts those church councils as being equal with the Word of God. They believe that the Holy Spirit guided those decisions. So they believe in what they call the living Word. That is, the Holy Spirit continues to speak to people today. And so they believe that those church councils are at the same level as the Bible. And that's the reason why they can believe and practice things that we don't find in the Bible. And, and they consider those traditions, but they consider those inspired traditions. Those are oral traditions. Well, the oral traditions is what the Pharisees held to. Here, Paul obviously is talking about the gospel. These are things, teachings that were passed down from Jesus to his apostles. 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2 the Apostle Paul says that we need to hold to the traditions that were handed down to us from Jesus Christ. And then we have the word here. Notice in verse 6, and we'll come back to the context next week of chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. So the gospel is a tradition in the Greek definition of the word, something that is handed down, that was handed down from Jesus through His Holy Spirit to the apostles. And then the apostles hand it down to other individuals who are faithful and trustworthy stewards of that gospel message. Yes. Teachings is a different word, but it means the same thing here. Okay, so the word tradition is a synonym in this context for teachings. Because again, if you look back at uh, verse 6 of chapter 3, uh, referring to those people who lead an unruly life not according to the teachings which you receive from us. So that's how Paul is using the word traditions here in this context. Sue? Would that be looking at like the tradition of the gospel is a private learning, you know, but many of the traditions that are done by men are outwardly works, which there's no way you can be saved by works, but you can be saved by God. I think the difference is the origin. If the origin is coming from man's heart, you can't be saved by it. And that's man's works. But if the tradition has, or the teaching has its origin in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Word, then you have to be obedient to that because that's given to us by God. Cody? The traditions of the Pharisees, the, the Pharisees used were rooted in... Uh, a desire to achieve what God wanted. But it went beyond God's word and, and, and put a burden on them that they did that God didn't put on. Them. Right. Jesus, in fact, uh, used the metaphor of putting a hedge around the law, right? So the law said, Don't violate the Sabbath. Uh, don't touch anything that is unclean which might be a better example because then the Pharisees said, well, okay, if you go out to the marketplace and then come back, you have to go through the, the ritual washing because you might have, notice the words, might have touched a dead animal in the marketplace. It's not that you did touch a dead animal in the marketplace, in which case you should go through the washings. But they made a law that if you went to the marketplace, you might have touched a dead animal, therefore you had to wash before you ate. That's where they crossed the line. It's okay for us to make decisions like that on an individual basis, but when I start binding my opinion on you, and that's, when I, that's when I put myself in the place of God and I become a, a judge of the law, which James condemns in James chapter 2. Rachel? Right, so when they did that, originally and made those rules, and they would have been judging 
kind of a thing God had set up, so it probably did stem from good intentions. I would. I would assume that at the very beginning, they did do it out of good intentions and a sincere heart. The Pharisees of Jesus' day, however, were not. Because you remember, Jesus criticized them because if, uh, what animal was it? If it fell into a pit? The ox. If an ox fell into a pit on the Sabbath day, they'd reach out and pick it up. But they criticized Jesus for healing a man on the Sabbath day. So they were being hypocritical. So by the time of the Pharisees' day, at the time of Jesus there was not any sincerity anymore. Jesus, in fact, was showing them where they were being inconsistent. But very early on, and the Pharisaic denomination of the Jewish religion dated about 150 years before Jesus. That's 150 years for those traditions to go from being sincerely held to being insincerely held. Good comments. Verse 16 Paul brings these thoughts to a close. Uh, now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. The verb translated now may shows that Paul is expressing a wish. This is a desire. I desire, he says, that the Lord Jesus and God the Father, who loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace and so forth. Now, just to ask the question to get us to look at the text, what has God given us? Everlasting consolation. My translation says eternal comfort. And what else? Good hope. By grace. What more could you want? Eternal comfort. Now this is the only place where these two phrases, eternal comfort and good hope, are used in the New Testament. What, what else could we help? we got eternal comfort. From the time you become a Christian in the waters of baptism, you have comfort that can never be taken away. Ever. Sometimes we feel like it's taken away from us because we tend to get short-sighted. But it can never be taken away from us. You remember John chapter 10, Jesus says, the Father has the ability to keep you in His hands. Now that doesn't mean we can't jump out of His hands, okay? We're not talking about eternal security. We're not talking about once saved, always saved. But we are talking about the fact that if we are honestly, sincerely trying to walk with Christ, God is going to take care of us. That's eternal comfort and good hope. Always keep in mind that hope in the biblical definition carries the idea of confident expectation. I use this illustration. When I was 12 years old and prayed for a Christian wife, I had hope, but I didn't have expectation. But when I, pray, when I proposed to Rachel and she said yes, and I put that engagement ring on her finger, then I had hope with expectation. Now, Christians don't have an empty hope. We've got hope with expectation. So we expect to be redeemed. We expect to be raised. We expect to see God with our own eyes. Job hoped to see God in the flesh. We have that expectation. Job does too now that Jesus has come. So God has given us eternal comfort and good hope by His grace. Verse 17, what is the missionary's wish for these young Christians? Comfort and strength. Comfort and strength in your hearts in every good work and word. Notice that's what Paul, the writers, want Jesus and God to do. He's described what they have done, loved us, and given us. Verse 17 is what, he, what he's hoping that God will do. In other words, this is the substance of my prayer, Paul might say, that God will comfort you and that He will strengthen your hearts for good work and good words. That encompasses our whole behavior, doesn't it? What we say and what we do. Cody? Cody? 
from the context of them him writing the letter to them, they were being riled up by these folks that, you know, said, Jesus already come, and just whatever, and then they're all like, wait, did we miss something? And so he's like, take easy folks, we got you. You know, come for your heart, you're okay. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's all kind of spiritual ideas and religious ideas floating around out there in the world. Just like these folks were dealing with the teaching that Jesus has already come. And those ideas a lot of times disturbs our hearts. And we start thinking, well, maybe I'm not right. Maybe what I believe isn't the truth. Maybe this, maybe that. And what we need to do when our faith gets shaken like that, when we start having doubts, is to go back to the Word. Remind ourselves of what the Word says. I mentioned before, when I read books that are teaching false doctrine on various topics or whatever, I just always go back to, well, here's what the Word says. This might sound good over here, but here's what the Word says. Then we go back to the truth and find comfort in the truth. Paul is about to tell us in chapter 3 that God is faithful. And we'll come back to that question in just a moment. Why is it important for us to remember that God is faithful? Rachel? Yep, we need to abide in the vine so that we can bear fruit. And if we abide in Him, He will abide in us. It's one of the points from the sermon this last Sunday, right? God dwells in us. God told Israel at Mount Sinai, I can't go with you because you're a sinful and stiff-necked people. If I did, I would destroy you. But He sends His Son to dwell in us. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. God the Father, in fact, dwells in us. The New Testament teaches that all three members of the Godhead dwell in us. That's pretty awesome. Any thoughts on those verses before we get into the first five verses of chapter 3? Okay, finally, Paul says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you, and that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, and He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. Maybe I should close every sermon I preach with those words. That's pretty encouraging words, isn't it? Well, I said close my sermon. <laughs> Okay, so what is the missionary's request here at the beginning of chapter 3? Paul is asking, the missionaries are asking the Christians to pray for them, right? The Thessalonians are young Christians. If scholars' estimation of the timing is correct, they've only been Christians for maybe a year or so. Even though, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15, Paul considered himself the father of those who, whom he taught and baptized. He said, I was your father in the gospel. He doesn't condescend to people. He doesn't talk down to them. He considers them on the same level spiritually as he is. He says, I want you to pray for me. Pray for us. He says, I want you to pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly, number one, and number two, be glorified or to be honored. Now this question I don't think was in the questions I gave you last week. Well, but what does it mean for the word of the Lord to be glorified or to be honored? Have you ever thought about that? We always talk about honoring Jesus, honoring God. But here Paul says, pray that the word can be honored. How do we honor the Word? By keeping it. By sharing it. By trusting it. Obeying. Yeah. Obeying the Word. Trusting the Word. Sharing the Word with others. Believing in the bottom of our hearts 
that the answers to religious questions are found in the Bible. And if the answer is in here, it's because God didn't want us to know it. That's Deuteronomy 29, 29, right? We go on in verse 2, where Paul says, uh, Pray also that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. The subject of persecution has been frequently brought up in First and Second Thessalonians, right? About the first half of First Thessalonians chapter 2 talked about persecution, and then he talked about it again later on in chapter 2 around verses 12 through 14, somewhere around in there, and, and then he comes back to it here in Second Thessalonians chapter 1. So if one does not have faith, based on this verse, what's the result? Bad things, persecution, become unfaithful. You don't have anything to stand on. And if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for. If you don't stand on, how's this song go? There you go. Who sings that? Okay. Who? Aaron Tippin. We got some country music fans in the audience. Okay, so, so pray that we'll be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. My guess is these perverse and wicked men Paul's talking about are Christians. My guess is these are the individuals who have been teaching that Jesus has already come again. So you see, Paul is dealing with false teachers in the church in his day and time. False teachers in the church is n n nothing new. Nothing new at all. The false teachings take different forms. They have different faces. But the substance is still the same. So Paul says everybody doesn't have faith. But, verse 3, the Lord is faithful. And He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Why is it important? Here's my question. Why is it important to remember that the Lord is faithful? So we can stay away from sin, Betty? So we trust what He says. Many, many years ago, I was sitting in a Bible class taught by a preacher slash professor, and he made the comment that God sometimes does, does things capriciously. I absolutely disagree with that. Capriciousness suggests the idea of, is this a word, undependability? Yeah, just reacting. The Lord is faithful. He's dependable. We can trust Him. Just because He doesn't work miraculously today doesn't mean the Lord isn't working. If Flabberg asks me when you talk to somebody and say, well, the Bible teaches that miracles aren't performed today, what do you mean? God isn't working today? You're the one binding God's hands, not me. If God says He doesn't do miracles anymore, then I trust Him. But that doesn't mean God isn't working. God's faithful. He's dependable. He's the same God, same God to save Noah and his family, same God to walk with Abraham, same God. We're going to study Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego during vacation Bible school and Daniel in the lion's den. Same God. I love Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response when the king said, bow down and worship. Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. We will not bow down and worship you. They said, our God will deliver us. But if not, here's the words of faith, but if not, we still will not worship a false god. I trust God's going to take care of me, but if He decides to let my body go into the earth, I'm still going to trust Him. Because fundamentally, family, Jesus rose from the dead. That's the essence and the core of our faith. And that makes everything Jesus taught true. That makes everything that His apostles teach true taught was to be true, the resurrection of Christ. It's the core of our faith. The Lord is faithful. Verse 4. We have confidence. 
I observed when I was translating this this morning, that is a perfect tense verb which carries the idea that we came to this conviction in the past and we still stand on that conviction. So the New American Standard translates that as uh, we have confidence. I don't know, but what may be a stronger translation would be we are convinced. That's the essence of that verb, the tense of the verb. We are convinced in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. What a, what a high level of conviction. Here's my question. Give the missionaries expectations of the young Christians here in verse 4. What's, what's his expectation? They'll continue in his teachings. Do what he commands. If we see something in the Word, if we hear something taught in Bible class or something preached from the pulpit that we are not doing... Can Jesus have the confidence that we will start doing it? Do we have that kind of trust in the Word of God? You know what? I've not been doing that. I need to start doing it. I'm going to start doing it. Because we've got, got that kind of faith in the truth. And a love for Christ, right? That's, that's where it comes from. I love Jesus. Paul uses this word command several times. Notice in this context. Again, we'll come back to verse 6 next week, but he uses the word command there in verse 6. Down in verse 10, the New American Standard translates it as to, to uh, give an order, but it's the same original word. And then in verse 12, such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion. So there's that same word. Command, command, command. The Bible never disparages commands. You read some people's writings like on Facebook or wherever today and it's like the word command is a bad word. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Like it's a seven letter word and you're not supposed to say it. The Bible never talks negatively about commands. Keep the commands. The law of Moses says, if you keep my commandments, you will live. The essence of that is the same. Now, the ground of our salvation is not perfect obedience, right? Because we don't earn our salvation. If we were to earn our salvation, that means we'd have to be perfect, sinlessly perfect, I mean, for the rest of our lives. And we can't do that. So good works can't be the grounds of our salvation. That's the sacrifice of Christ and the perfect life of Christ. The sacrifice of Christ was powerful because His life was perfect. If He had died on the cross and had sins, He would have been dying for His own sins. But He didn't have any sins. And that's what made that sacrifice possible for us. And Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my what? Commandments. Don't ever disparage commandments. And if you hear somebody disparaging the commandments of God, slap them. Just kidding. Verse 5. One more wish here. Paul expresses verse 5. May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. So into what did the missionaries desire the Lord to direct the Christians' hearts? The love of God... How deep is the love of God? Deeper than the ocean, wider than the sea. So Betty's going to sing the song for us over here. I pray the Lord will direct you in the love of God and what else? The steadfastness of Christ. What does steadfastness have to do with being a Christian? You have to know the truth, but what does steadfastness have to do with it? Stick with it. Steadfastness is, is perseverance. My sermon Sunday night is from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, the parable of the persistent widow. The title of the sermon, because I get my sermon titles from some other source, is called The Tenacious Faith. 
tenacious faith. So here Paul is saying, may the Lord Jesus direct your hearts into the love of God and the tenacity of Jesus Christ. I had a Bible professor who used the word stick to Even Jesus had to do that to save her. Jesus had to be tenacious to stay perfect. He was tempted, like we tempted in every way like as we are, yet without sin. Steadfast. Okay, so if you're going to use a cleaner on your carpet, you have to change, check it in a spot over here to make sure that the color is steadfast. That's right. right. That's what you're supposed to do. It's what you're supposed to do. How many of us do it? Okay. So steadfastness is sticking with Jesus Christ. In the good times and in the bad times, the Old Testament is full of examples of men leaving God when things go well. Leaving God when things go well. And so if we are affluent, we need to stick with Christ. And if we're poor, we need to stick with Christ. Regardless of what happens, because the Lord is faithful, right? Verse 3, He'll stick with us if we stick with Him. Any other thoughts or comments or questions or snide remarks? We got, what, 15, 13 verses, 14 verses next week? And that's, this next week will be a biggie. We'll be talking about withdrawing fellowship. This is one of those texts. Matthew chapter 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful again for this hour that we've spent feeding on your word. Strengthen us through your, your word, Father. Help us to stand fast in it. Help us to hold tightly to it. Help us to trust you. Bless us through the night, Father. Give us a good day tomorrow. Forgive us when we sin. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.